Hello there, Future Explorers Conference. My name is Nick Badminton. I'm a futurist based out here in Toronto, Canada. And thank you to Benjamin and the team for having me come along to speak. I'm here virtually. I'm sat in my living room back at home. It's a little bit too far to me to come uh, to mix up with all the other work that's actually happening right now. But I really wanted to uh, give you this talk today to really sort of discuss what it meant if we started with dystopia as an idea, where could we go as futurists and how we could be responsible for helping people think about positive futures. Now I like to always start with, with, a, with a pithy quote, something to get us really thinking. And, and really there, there's something that's always rang true in my mind that you don't know heaven until you've gone through hell. So we really have to understand what it feels like to be in a desperate situation or to understand a future that's maybe not so good, a dystopia really. And this idea of, of a future that, that's terrible has got me thinking about our work as futurists. Now this is a presentation about the good visions of multiple futures from our ideas of dystopia. So I hope that this really gets you thinking and I'm going to join for a Q&A at the end. So who am I? Well, I've, I've been working in technology for most of my life. I sat down at a computer at the age of eight. I've really saw the new world at university in 1993 to 96. I played with artificial intelligence and linguistics and grammar. Uh, what do I do? I work with clients all over the world. I give a lot of keynotes. I've given about 300 keynotes in the last four years. And why am I here? I'm here to make the world a better place. I'm here to help people think about a future that integrates technology but doesn't take away from humanity. I'm here to help you think a little bit about our practice as futurists. And I'm here to, to help CEOs, associations, governments and world leaders really think about a positive future. Now, I'm an optimist. I want positive futures. That's what my keynotes and, and research is all about. When I sit down with my clients, I really get them to start thinking about where they want to be a little further out than that quarterly cycle or 18 month cycle that they're used to with strategic thinking. I also produce an event uh, of speakers uh, once a year uh, called Dark Futures. This year it's going to be in Toronto and Vancouver, New York City and San Francisco. And, and that's an evening where I invite people to come and look at the hidden world, the hidden systems, the things that are a little bit darker. Now a couple of years ago a really great friend of mine Jordan Eshpeter came in uh, to, to speak and I've been hassling him to come and speak for a, for a number of years and he spoke about es eschatology. It's that part of theology that's concerned with judgment and the final destiny of the soul and humankind. It's about apocalypse, it's about revelation, it's about those end of days. And it was really interesting, I never really heard of that idea of eschatology but, but really we've our culture has been rooted in a dystopian idea of a future so that we can have you know, a bait set of rules, whether it's religion, whether it's governmental regime, to, to live a life that, that avoids that. Now, we're a little bit more flexible today uh, outside of those religious and regime boundaries. Well, mo most of the places around the world, most of the people in those places as well. But really, eschatology has been a powerful tool for thinking of dystopias and comes from storytelling. So horror stories, campfires, science fiction, absolute fact, and even the Bible. It started as a control mechanism, and today we have science fiction that's kind of rooted in that. So having said that, I pulled together a clip of a few of my favorite movies that look to the future and a dystopian way of looking at the world and starts to tell the story about the warnings that we have so that we can maybe make better choices about today.
want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Well, I hope you enjoyed that. These powerful, terrifying and entertaining stories that have seeped into popular culture and are now mostly being propagated through mainstream media, blogs, podcasts, social media, uh, are really the forewarning of modern society out of control. Uh, and if you look at the buzz around the world, you know, everything from large governments to, to military operations to just, just plain craziness in terms of the decisions that people are making, uh, makes us think of, of a dystopian future. And it really what makes me want to think that, you know, dystopia truly is real. Now, what is dystopia? It's an imagined state of society in which there's great suffering or injustice, typically one that's totalitarian or post-apocalyptic. It sounds rather dramatic and maybe that drama is essential in us thinking about this. But one of the biggest tools that we have as futurists is to use imagination. And that tool is really, really useful when we think about the accelerators for technology and culture society, how we're thinking, how we're structured, and how the world is turning and changing as well. But really, I think that there's like three different kinds of dystopia. I think there's the real dystopias, the cacistocracies, the inequalities, climate crises, mass migration, surveillance, human suffering and pain. Then I think there's a more academic view. You know, this is where we look at VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And a lot of people bring that into their practice as well. There's also the weird side of the world. And, and it's really compelling to listen to some of this. This is the conspiracy theories, the cults, and the transforming, th the transforming threat of, of information warfare and social media with good and bad actors. It's just stranger than fiction. And really, this, this coming together uh, and the apex of real, academic, and weird is really our focus as humanists and futurists. We have to think about how we as humans fit into the center of these stories and try and survive so that we can create a better world. Now, I actually propose that there's a new way to look at dystopia. Um, we can completely reimagine what dystopias do in the context of business and in the work that we do. If we can imagine a world that's so terrible, then we can incentivize to leap into action to avoid the consequences. So this makes me think about how we come to looking at dystopia and how that works with our practices around foresight. Now, dystopia and, and this, this incredibly uh, terrifying future uh, helps us create human agency. It encourages us to think about causes and the solutions. It creates connections between like-minded thinkers like us and the people that we affect with our stories. It encourages hope. It creates inclusivity and it also encourages diversity as well because we're directly affronting that terrible future that's been put before us. Talking, taking climate change seriously, discussing bias, ethical boundaries, knowing what big tech cannot and should not wholly control our words are, are way, ways of looking at this. Now, there are a few ways that I, I like to use dystopias in framing with my clients and also some, some positive stories as well. And these come in, in four parts. The first is around signals of change. Then there's foresight planning. And then I think the power of art, performance and science fiction really plays a huge role in what we do. And then I think that there's, there's the hope and the optimism that we need to channel to really impact the world. So let's start with signals of change. Now this is a term that I've used and maybe some of you use this as well. These are the trends that we see happening in the world today. They might be well funded, they might start be starting to take off, uh, they have the potential to disrupt the current way of life. So some examples could be renewable energy or machine learning. 
there, there's lots of examples and I'm just gonna scroll through a presentation that I've given before. It's a post keynote report that looks at cities and it's talking about everything from like energy and transportation through to new kinds of construction, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, all the technologies that are gonna seep into the infrastructure around us and are fundamentally gonna change the culture of living in this modern world. Another tool beyond signals of change that I use is uh, uh, the futures cone. Obviously, we know that this, this, is, this is grounded in, uh, in, in the early days of thinking about foresight and strategy, the idea of possible, plausible, projected, probable, and preferable futures. I actually think that there's something interesting to think about with preposterous futures, and this aligns with dystopia a little bit. You know, the things that we deny, I always say that denial is not a river in Africa, and uh, it always raises a laugh, but really it's quite serious. We can't deny that there's some things changing in the world, that the preposterous can actually become real. Then there's world building. A really great friend of mine, Leah Zaidi, a, a notable futurist here in Toronto, has done a lot of work with, with people, graduate of OCAD, worked with UNESCO recently, um, talks about you know, world building and really looking at the model where you can look at social, political, economic, philosophical, environmental, scientific and tra technological and artistic uh, dimensions. And she starts off with the idea of dystopias or preferred futures. And both of those help her think and, and help her clients think about the different uh, places that we're headed to in the next few years and what needs to be done. It's a really fascinating model and I'm going to link to that um, as, as part of the post presentation here then I actually think that foresight can actually be seen as a, as a business strategy. It can be seen as an interconnection between you know, the client, the citizen, or the person, the solution provider. We can actually look at the partnerships, the strategic advice, and the speculative usage of services to understand uh, the impacts that they have. And we can look to those terrible futures to, to avoid falling into a trap where that technology or that process is no longer serving us as humanity and maybe is just serving the solution provider. And I like to mix that with hypotheses and strategies. And this is where we take traditional business strategy and really start to help people think out five, 10, 20 years into the future, set hypotheses. You can set roadmaps into those futures and check in every, every quarter, every six months, every year to really understand the progress towards those futures. You can adjust, you can bring in new technologies, you can bring in new ways of working, and you can test out how to build a future ready organization. Then we have art and performance. You know, it's emotional, it's visceral, it really speaks to us. You know, visual and auditory uh, stimuli really evokes a sense of, of, of how we can live today and where we can go into the future. By drawing a picture of where we're headed, it can really warn us of some of the problems that are coming. It can also shape a world that, we're, that makes us more resilient. Earlier this year, I went to Primer 19 down in New York City. It was uh, two days, amazing speakers and, and, and lots of different discussions. One of the things that really surprised me was the amount of, of, of speculative art and artists that, that were actually part of the roster down there. Now, the first person that really blew me away was a guy called Ao, and you can find him at ao.io. Uh, his name is Ayo Damoola Tanimoo Okusiende. Uh, I hope I got that right. And really he likes to look at um, not just Afrofuturism, obviously he, he's of African descent, lives in, in Brooklyn, and is really uh, sort of entrenched in, in a world where there's multiple uh, genders, race, uh, different kinds of people working together. He likes to look at reclamation. He's reclaiming his sense of blackness, reclaiming his sense of, of having a purpose in the world that's ultimately been shaped by people that are, that are not like it. He looks at the intersection of magic and technology. It's absolutely amazing. So AO's project, The Rift, uh, culminates in a performance, a narrative that he created in 2015 where he, he wore an actual spacesuit that he made himself. He, he can't breathe without it, so he really needs to wear it and needs to be functional. Uh, but, but being in normal situations, and he tries to think about an astronaut from the future that travels back in time to try and understand the collapse of culture. And through being in the world today, but coming from that point in the future, helped him think about what 
society thought about him, his role in the world, and, and the role of, of bias in understanding who are the superheroes that can really shape that world of space travel as well. So fascinating project, The Rift. Another couple of designers that I saw at Primer 19 as well were Parsons and Charlesworth. Now they actually do projects that look at design and armchair survivalism. Uh, they, they, they've, they've undergone a number of different projects around the world. They do a lot in Chicago and across North America as well. And they actually put something together called the Catalogue for the Post-Human. Now this is a discursive tool to raise awareness among labor advocates of the issues of underrepresented workers and, and the, those issues that they face in a future where they, they may be expected to augment themselves in order to stay competitive, a transhumanist future in, in the future of work. And, and that really got me thinking about, you know, exactly, you know, what we need. I, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, advocate for things like smart drugs and transhumanism. I've got a microchip in my hand. I can use it to uh, control various RFID devices I have around the home and in the office. And, and I like to think about that, but really it's fascinating uh, PDF that you can download and you can take a look at. I'll, I'll include a link to that as well. And, and really that helps us think about everything from physical and mental augmentation to what our role in the future world actually means. Then I like to look at science fiction and as a child I was enthralled with everything from Star Wars to Star Trek and 2001 A Space Odyssey and beyond. I'm a big fan of that. The clip that I showed earlier had lots of different science fiction movies in that as well and, and really some of this really inspires us to think about what could happen in, in the future. I mean you've even got things like the X Prize that set out a, a challenge to create a tricorder which was only really a concept from, from Star Trek. It was fascinating to see what people could do with off-the-shelf technology to use it for diagnosis of diseases as well. If we use science fiction as a speculative futures device, we can use it to prepare us for conversations and projects to map out the futures uh, ahead of us. Now, obviously, we can draw on, on some classic science fiction, Minority Report and Gattaca, amazing film about genetic editing and a future where we might be able to choose how, how good our children are versus leaving it down to, to nature. I also love the, the, the set of, uh, of graphic novels uh, called Transmetropolitan by Warren Ellis. Uh, and really with spider Jerusalem in there and what he's doing with modern media and, and how he's, he's, he's angrily out in the world. They've even got a president called, called the Beast that really looks quite similar to a president that might be in power right now in North America as well. So uh, it's pretty telling, especially if you read a little bit about what they think and how they see, it, see the world. But really, there's been a lot of discussion recently in the press around whether science fiction writers can actually prepare us for this uncertain future. Are they always just going to consider dystopias or are they just going to write that, that horror story that, that really worries us or are they really going to bring us into a world of hope? Now, I'm just going to read a quote by a, a writer called Rose Eveleth uh, from, from Wide magazine recently. And she says this, if we think that science fiction is really a reliable tool for inferring what might come tomorrow, then, then it has a natural place in future planning. But if it is not, then it runs the risk of convincing us that a certain future is inevitable. Can science fiction writers be trusted to frolic through boardrooms forecasting the future without supervision? Now, I think this assumes a whole bunch of things that people bring us in, that we're just going to go go about our business, not really talk to anyone, do it in a vacuum, and then spit out a bunch of artifacts at the end and say, here's a bunch of stories, here's a couple of futures for you, and then goodbye. That's not how we work. We're collaborative. Even, even science fiction writers on the more artistic side of, 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 of authoring uh, you know, prose and, and different kinds of, of, of works need to have some, some structure and, and, and control around that. And I think that's where we can work with those authors as well. The worry from Rose in, in her piece isn't necessarily a deterrent from science fiction stepping into helping people think about a future. It's more of a word of warning and we need to take this on board. Even most recently, the French army has created a, a red team of science fiction writers to imagine the possible future threats that, that they're going to have. This new report by their Defense Innovation Agency said that the visionaries will propose scenarios of destruction, disruption and destruction that military strategists may not think of, right? We're good at that. 
The team's highly confidential work will be important in the fight against malicious elements in the world. Now at the Bastille Day Parade, they actually wheeled out some really interesting uh, speculative futures. Um, soldiers with very large futuristic drone guns. And also, uh, you, 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 had, you, you had soldiers with, with uh, semi-automatic weapons floating around on these, on these jet boards in hugely science fiction kind of ways. And, and probably scared the hell out of the crowd as well. Are these things practical? Are these things likely to come to pass? Well, you know, the military's looking at everything, and if we see the amount of money that's poured into organizations like DARPA, we know that they're really fundamentally important to shaping a future with technology. We just have to put some guardrails around it when it comes to us and when we start to apply some of that thinking to the businesses that we work with. But that leads me to think about positive futures. We pontificate on the utopian idea of the world, what's perfect but kind of can't actually exist. A protopia where year by year um, we get better over time. Kevin Kelly is a big proponent of that as well. And polytopias, the idea that there are multiple futures for all of us. I love that idea. The idea that we've got one future is probably a little bit behind these days and we need to think about that polytopian world. But we can't just pontificate on these ideas and discuss academically which is the right one or the wrong one. We have to get on with our job. What is inevitable is that time is marching on. And we need to sow the seeds uh, of doubt and consideration and really water them and help use our imagination and hope to drive the world forward and really apply it to situations today so that we can lay uh, a foundation that can be used tomorrow. Now, I actually think that there's some rules of practical engagement around dystopias and, and planning out using foresight and some of the tools that I've used to get executives to take this seriously, to get world leaders to take things seriously as well. I think that optimism is the number one thing that we need. And uh, I was chatting to uh, one, one of my family, actually, and she said that optimism is the only moral choice. And I love that phrase. It's the only thing that we can have. Anything else as futurists and, and as leaders in this world is not good enough. Secondly, we need hard data, ir irrefutable sources. Um, we need it to come from multiple sources that are trusted. We need to go over it again and again and again before we really put our ideas out there that are backed with that data and that insight that we can use to, to shape new worlds. Then really one of the most important things and that we've seen through this presentation is storytelling and this presentation itself is a little bit like that as well. If we get good at storytelling, setting it up, who's the hero, are they going to get in trouble, how do they overcome those losses and great threats and how do they have a positive ending, this is going to be hugely important for what we do as well. And really, the, the open minds that we have, imagination and futures for everyone, it is really important. I really want to hit that home. And really, I think that doing this and working with organizations help us really embed foresight as a culture. Because a cultural approach to a new way of working is something that's embedded and it's natural when someone wakes up, goes to work, comes home from work and continues on in their lives. I think one of the biggest tools that I've, I've talked about in this entire presentation is hope. Hope and optimism. Hope keeps our mind at ease. It lowers our stress, actually, and improves physical health. It's actually a powerful tool. So if we work with our clients and imbue them with hope, we can actually help them feel more relaxed about that future. So I actually think that futurists are hope engineers. I really love this idea. A hope engineer would really help us engineer situations where hope is easy to understand, where optimism thrives, and that we can actually plan out those futures that we really, really want. We need to consider the capacity for change and the complexity that makes it hard, and we need to create that agency around hope. But we also need to be very, very careful that we don't choose to colonize the future. Now, this is a very new concept to me, and I saw this at a UNESCO event uh, being spoken about. 
Now, the idea of colonization is we say, here's the future, subscribe to that, and the world's gonna be great. Everyone falls into line, and then off we go into the new world. We have to understand that everyone is different. Um, we've, got, we've already got bias against race and age and gender and, and a number of other factors as well. We have to create a level playing field. We have to understand that everyone's got a future. Those futures may be completely different, and that's absolutely valid. That can be really tough with the extremism that we see. So we have to also be careful about putting guardrails around what we need in terms of what's a safe future as well. We have to kind of foreclose on the old world to avoid colonizing the future. We have to think about possibility. If colonization happens on purpose or by accident, we, we come into a situation in two, three years down the line in an organization or a government, we've got people literally working within boxes that they're told to work in and, and bias is rife, then we have to address that as well. That means that we haven't really taken dystopias seriously. We haven't questioned them. We haven't really challenged our clients to think differently about what that dystopia means in the future and that it doesn't destroy their business. The dystopia, the hope and optimism, the platforms that we build that address them can actually be a very profitable world, both for humanity and for business as well. If we are on a path to create an open-minded, positive and multiple futures-based world, then we will continue to do our jobs well. Thank you very much.